Hello everybody, welcome to Monday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. Stage 3 of the Giro is currently going off as we speak. I will bring you the results of that shortly. We'll talk about stages 1 and 2 as well. We'll catch up on the rest of the cycling news. But first, before you complain that the thumbnail or the title gives away the result of today's stage, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. We're a business, we're trying to grow the channel and yes, it might spoil your highlights later on tonight. And listen, I'll give you the option. Untick that notification bell. Stay subscribed, and if you've not subscribed already, make sure you subscribe. But if you want to avoid the result, do not go on social media. Do not blame me if you can't stay off of YouTube for two hours until you see the results, all right? There are times when I don't want to see the MotoGP result. I'll go on Instagram and I'll see it and I'll go, ah. But I don't comment on MotoGP. Say, why are you posting about the winner? Did you not know that I haven't watched it? No. So, don't be mad. Don't leave comments. Just accept that that's going to be happening over the next couple of weeks. All right? Uncheck that notification bell. Stay subscribed. Stay off of social media until you've seen the result. And then hopefully we can all chat about it in the evening. Sound good? Great. Let's get on with the news. There we go. First up in the news over on Cycling News, Bradley Wiggins is set to release a brand new documentary in 2022. And according to Cycling News, it could be potentially explosive. Wiggins told Cycling News that they're going to be doing a follow-up with John Dower. They did a year in yellow back 10 years ago. Going on to say, we did a year in yellow, obviously, and it's 10 years next year, so we're going to revisit that, really. There's been a boom in cycling in the last 10 years, but it'll be nice to go back as a different person. We've done a pilot for it and a lot has happened over the last couple of years. It will be nice to finally be able to talk about that and maybe show some stuff that shows how crazy it all got. That's the running script at the moment. When it gets released, that's going to be next year. I don't know what working title is, but maybe Life After Yellow. I mean, I guess what they're getting at is that he's going to reveal some, some, some stuff that is going to make a lot of people look bad. But I can't help thinking that Anybody that did something illegal within British Cycling or Team Sky, i.e. using performance enhancing drugs or bending, bending the rules to the absolute limit, they would have only done so for someone like Brad in 2012. I mean, look at the TUE he had issued to him for, for the Giro d'Italia in 11, 12 and 13, I think which was a quarter costacoid. I mean, we can, we can all be completely naive and believe that it was genuinely needed, but this is a banned substance that shouldn't be used in competition, yet we're getting a TUE for it to allow it to be used in competition. How valid was that TUE? And I'm sorry if that's skeptical, but why would we believe anybody ever again in cycling? I want to. And those those riders that have no blots on their copybook, I genuinely believe are clean. Of course there's clean riders. But when you look at something like that, all within the rules technically, but absolutely bent out of all proportion to ensure that we could get a TUE, to ensure that we could take this, to ensure that we stood the best chance of winning. I don't know, who knows what the documentary is going to be about. However, it is going to be really interesting and it is nice to see him back on the TV for the Giro d'Italia um, shows across on Eurosport and obviously G Leave your comments down below on this one. Um, Bradley Wiggins is always a good subject to talk about, um, but is there going to be an explosive documentary? Is he going to expose the system which he was used and abused in? Or was he part of the system that he's going to try and expose? I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. It'd be interesting to get your thoughts on it. As ever, leave your comments down below. Next up in the news, the ball will just keep rolling today <laughs> with doping as ex-Trek Segafredo rider Andre Cardoso failed in his appeal to get his doping ban overturned from back in 2017. He tested positive for EPO back in 2017 and he got a four-year ban for it. He tried to get that ban dismissed, but the Court of Arbitration for Sport said, eh, eh, ban staying, knobhead. Cardoso released a statement denying any wrongdoing. Surprise, surprise, saying, getting the chance to ride at the pinnacle of 
professional cycling is the greatest honour I could have ever hoped for and I was looking forward to doing my best for my team and myself at the Tour. I believe in a clean sport and I have always conducted myself as a clean athlete. But I realise that this news puts a dark cloud on not just myself, but also our sport and my team, teammates and staff. It's like, it's like an episode of Jeremy Kyle, right? When you've seen it, the scrow refuses to admit that he slept with his girlfriend's mom and they go round in circles and then the lie detector comes out. You were lying. Oh no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. 10 hours later, all right, I did sleep with her, yeah. Just, mate, you've been caught. Just, just set fair dues. I screwed up. I thought I was gonna get away with it. Didn't get away with it. I'll, 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 I'll pay the price. I'll take the consequences. And that is a four, four year ban. And there is no way it should get reversed. And I don't think it's gonna, but have that. Talk, hey, talking of doping, one positive, not test, but a positive outcome was that over a weekend, police in Spain have taken down an industrial scale doping lab seizing three million drug doses. <sighs> Investigators made 20 searches in homes and businesses across multiple cities in Spain, including Malia, Almeria, Cadiz, Castellón and City Real. 21 were arrested in connection with the criminal organization. That's mental. This wholesaler was using a network of receiving centers sent out from logistics warehouse that only two heads of operations had access to. At one receiving center, 84,000 tablets and 2,500 bottles of oral and injectable performance enhancing drugs were found. Evidence of counterfeiting doping drugs was also discovered. In total, 1.3 million units of anabolic and other injectable products were found, as well as 31,000 doses of growth hormone. So a performance enhancing drug is to get the best out of someone, to get the best out of an athlete. Why would you go to someone who's counterfeiting <laughs> performance enhancing drugs? Is it like a placebo effect? If I literally wrote EPO on a paracetamol and sold it as EPO, would that increase their performance capacity? <laughs> would they be a better cyclist for it? Who knows? But if, you, if you're producing counterfeit goods, like if you're, if you're chopping up, can we talk about recreational drugs on this channel? I don't know. But listen, you got some cocaine, you got some baking powder, you dilute that cocaine with a bit of baking powder, right? I think that's how they do it. Makes it go further, more profit. People still get what they want out of that cocaine, although it's um, a lesser quality feeling. I don't know, I think. Than if it was like just pure cocaine, right? But with performance enhancing drugs, what, what do you, how, how do you produce a, you put like baking powder, you make a tablet of baking powder and just say, honestly, that is an anabolic steroid. Or you just put water in a vial and say, inject that into you, you'll get bigger muscles. But then the mind will play tricks, then you'll think you're getting bigger muscles. Oh, I don't know. It's mental. Mental. If you were, if you were going to. If you, if you were going to do performance enhancing drugs, would you go and buy counterfeit ones? <laughs> Stupidity on the biggest scale. Leave your comments down below. Doping. It's a mugs game. Unless you're Lance Armstrong. Next up in the news, let's talk racing news. Over the weekend, it was announced by Patrick Lefebvre, the, um, the managing director, direct sport. I don't know exactly. He's a main man at the Coney Quick Step. He's a manager, right? He just announced that Jao Almeida and Sam Bennett will not be renewing their contracts in 2022. Bennett could actually be returning to Bora Hansgrohe, which will leave the door open. We spoke about this a few new shows ago to Peter Sagan, who might come in to the coin it quick step in 2022. But here's the big question, where will Zhao Almeida go? He's proven himself to be a GC contender, but, but where is he likely to fit in? Where will he get the chance to go for his grand tours? Leave your comments down below. Zhao Almeida, where will he go? Do you think Sam Bennett should return to put a hands grower? And if so, will that give the, um, the opportunity for Peter Sagan to slip into the coin quick step? 
Acer Gamer musical chairs, but very interesting to just, I mean, right now at the minute, Sam Bennett is one of the hottest sprinters on the planet. Is this, a, is this an Alex Ferguson move? Like Fergie always knew the right moment to ditch a player. Even when they were at the height, the moment they left Manu, they were kind of done. And he just got the best out of them and then they moved on and never really sustained what they, uh, what they achieved at Man United. Is it the same with Sam Bennett at Deconi Quickstep? Does Lefebvre see something in him that thinks he's not going to be able to perform at this level next year? Let's get him out nice and early and bring someone new in. Let's bring Peter Sagan in, who's not necessarily going to win, but a bigger name in cycling overall, and he kind of fits that Wolfpack mentality. I don't know. But anyway, leave your comments down below. Let's talk Giro Haditalia. All right, let's have a recap over the weekend. First up, stage one was an individual time trial. There was doubts about this man going into the stage. They weren't too sure if he was going to be able to um, fulfill his potential that he, um, he accomplished last year when he got three TT stage wins and a road stage win at the Giro d'Italia. But Filippo Garner destroyed, decimated, incapacitated, massed, um, just absolutely annihilated the field. He ended up in the Maglio Rosa after stage one. Unbelievable performance. Stage two was always going to come down to a bunch sprint, pan flat stage. Going into this stage, clearly the favourite was Caleb Ewan. He was showing the most form, the best form of the recent sprinters. But you had the likes of Elio Viviani, Giacomo Nizzolo, Tim Merlier. He's been showing some good form, but this is Alpacin Phoenix's first ever Grand Tour. So you'll be forgiven for thinking that he wouldn't be quite up there when it came down to the bunch sprint, but how wrong was I? Fernando Gaviria, he was also supposedly up there. He was one of the favourites going into the stage, but it was actually Tim Merlier from Alpes in Phoenix who took the victory. Ahead of Giacomo Nizzolo, Elio Viviani was in third. Dylan Gruenewegen, first bunch sprint back since that horrendous incident at Poland last year. He was sprinting for fourth position. Peter Sagan, he was in 5th and all the way down in 10th was Caleb Ewan. Now the most unlucky rider coming into this bunch sprint was Fernando Gaviria, Team UAE Emirates rider. He ended up getting himself boxed in by his own teammate. God damn that's annoying. But yeah unfortunately for Fernando Gaviria he, um, he had to cut his sprint short and yeah massive props. Not only to Alpes in Phoenix because they were working hard on the front for the majority of the day but also Tim Elia for for smashing it to pieces, for not succumbing to the pressure of the World Tour teams and those big names in that sprint and taking that victory in Stage 2. Now, Stage 3 is happening as we speak, and right now we're going to have a transition, and I'm going to tell you the result. So the story of Stage 3 of the Giro d'Italia was all about those big-name sprinters being able to get over those three categorised climbs in today's stage in the front group to be able to contest that sprint. Far from being pan flat, far from being mountainous, there was a Cat 3 climb in there, two Category 4 climbs as well, as a little lump towards the end. And it was Bora Hansgrohe who sat on the front of the group for the majority of the day, trying to just increase that pace just enough up those climbs to try and shell out as many of those big name sprinters. One of the biggest being Caleb Ewan, as well as a few others, Giacomo Nizzolo, didn't make it across. Fernando Gaviria did, Peter Sagan did, Elia Viviani did, but unfortunately for Peter Sagan, he didn't have any more teammates towards the end of the race and Team UAE started to take that pace up. But eventually, it wouldn't matter because it was a rider from the breakaway who took victory. The breakaway stayed out for the majority of the day. A few of them got caught. Two of the final riders in that breakaway was Pelud and Taco van der Horn. Van der Horn attacked Pelud with around 8.8 .8 kilometers to go. He went off on his own. Seemed a bit of a stupid move because really what those two should have, well, it didn't really matter in the end because he ended up winning, but it looked likely that it would have been better for those two riders to work together to try and stay away from the peloton. He went off on his own and somehow managed to stay away from the peloton. Coming into the final kilometer, he still had 14 seconds but it did rise up towards the finish, so it looked like the, the, the peloton might have closed him down. Not a chance. He ended up soloing himself to victory. Meaning the rest of the sprinters were fighting out for second place. Chimalaya came over the line in second place, eventually ahead of Peter Sagan. Elia Viviani in fourth, Paddy Bevin in fifth, and Gaviria, after his teammates did a lot of work towards the end, ended up finishing seventh. In terms of GC, not a goddamn thing changed. 
Filippo Garner still wears the Malio Rosa ahead of Tobias Foss and Remco Evenepoel moves himself up into third place. Did you watch the stage? Did I spoil the stage for you? Leave your comments down below. What do you think to that move? Coming from eight almost nine kilometers to go, almost unheard of that a rider going solo when he has got someone to ride with, especially when they've been in the breakaway all day, ends up managing to stay away from the peloton. But they do, they, it wasn't like there wasn't no organization in the peloton, but after Bora Hansgrohe had, had sacrificed all their riders to try and eliminate as many sprinters as possible, there was just no one for them to work. So it meant Peter Sagan was on his own and no one really picked up the pace other than Team UAE Emirates for Fernando Gaviria, but yeah, it was a bit of a mismatch for those sprinters to try and make it across to uh, Van der Horn on his own, and he ended up winning. What a bloody result. Leave your comments down below. So that's it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure if you're not done already, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Don't hit that notification bell if you're worried about getting spoilers for the next three weeks. I understand that you might not want to see it flash up on your phone or, or on your desktop or however you get your notifications, but please know that if you come on YouTube, be expected to see the result of the stage. If you've not seen it already, don't get annoyed at me. Thanks for watching. I will see you tomorrow.